I wrote down a note uh, this morning. My, I had breakfast with my friend, and I said, what shall I ask Mike Mills? And he said, Ewan McGregor is the ultimate man. <laughs> I was like, that's not a question. <laughs> but that made me think, I should ask that. It's a good way in... Um, how does it How feel? is I so vain it, yeah. to cast the well, ultimate exactly. man as myself? Yeah. How did, did that come that to you? Did you? Yeah, that's kind of my question. Well, <laughs> that's such a setup. Um, um, I mean, actually, to be honest, I really don't think of Oliver as totally myself, even though he's obviously very, has many part of my parts or, you know, my perspective. Whenever everybody always loves to ask that question, to be honest, and I always feel like kind of fainting in my vomit because it's like, ah, it's just too nervous making. I really, this is the only way I knew how to tell a story. It was from the son's perspective. Um, but I don't, believe it or not, I'm not a wild narcissist and it sort of like it makes me dizzy every time. And all my conversations with Ewan were like, you know, do not be me. <laughs> you know? yeah, right. and, the, and the Christopher who's playing a character based on my dad is like, you know, don't worry about us. The job is to tell a story to an audience, not to like think about us or be burdened by us or be caught up and like, are you getting us right? And I remember saying that a lot to Ewan who is just like the most handsome, charming man in the whole world. Yeah. <laughs> he really, like everybody has a huge crush on him and meets him. And he's just, an, he's just a really great guy. And I, I remember saying to him all the time, like, don't, don't think about that, don't worry about that. And so we started, made the movie, we're great friends. We started doing press and I'm sitting next to Ewan and I'm telling the story. I always said, don't worry about it. And he, and he says, oh no, I looked at you. And I was like, oh fuck, you know. <laughs> and he said, no, I, I copied your voice a little bit. No, I, I'd, I'd steal some things. But Whoa. it was kind of good that he did it that way. He just did what he... If he could gain something, he would sort of yeah. take something. But it, it really wasn't my uh, goal. How does, it, how does it work? I think lots of people... In, I mean, did you have a, in mind uh, sort of a person who was going to play that role or the role of the father? And then... What do you do? Do you, do you send them an email? Or? <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, no. Uh, well, I'm not a very powerful director, so you never think you're going to get like Ewan McGregor and Christopher yeah. Plummer being your movie. It's just it would be silly to think that. It'd be dangerous because it's like a pipe dream. So I actually was, if I was thinking about anybody, I was thinking about people much less renowned. Yeah. Um, but I don't write with anybody in mind. That just sort of messes me up. Um, when it came time to try to go out for people, the way the way film industry, the, at least the kind that I'm involved in, like my movie costs three million dollars, which is a huge amount of money and also not that much money in the film world. But even that much money, you really need quote unquote movie stars to get financing. It's not financed off of the director, off the script, off your your past work. It's really yeah. it's, the bank loan is off of the actors. So uh, it's a very complicated, it's like running for president. It's the closest I'm ever going to get to running for president is trying to get like Ian McGregor in your movie. You know, you, get, you meet like everybody you possibly can. You're trying to tell them why it would be such a great idea. Um, lo and behold, when you meet Ewan, he's uh, actually this is the most down to earth, easy going, nice guy, likes the script for the right reasons, does it for scales, like the lowest union rate you could get paid, yeah. became like my great friend and... I didn't see that coming at all. Yeah. You know, I remember someone said he read it, and like if you're in Los Angeles, you don't believe anybody read your script. You just shouldn't. You know, so I was like bullshit. You know, uh, and he wants to meet you at this coffee shop, and I'm bullshit. You know, uh, and I'm driving down there. Oh, either he's going to be an ass, or he actually didn't read it, or he wants to change it all around, or you know, something yeah. like that. And then you know, just he's just the the best guy. So it's really very fortunate and unlikely yeah and what are the similarities between you because it's not it's not it is fiction mm. what are the similarities between you and oliver because he's a designer and he yeah no he, i definitely took well okay the film really started with i my real dad came out of the closet when he was 75 and led a really different life and was like so much more emotionally available with me and we started having totally new kind of conversations about him and me and love and dogs and sex and you know everything yeah. and it was good and and then he passed away and i kind of wasn't done with that conversation so that's the, that's the story I was trying to tell is like this kind of conversation about love from his perspective, being born in 
as a gay man in 1924 who was married for 44 years, and, and then me as a uh, guy who was born in 1966 who's you know, coming from a straight perspective, and and um, that was the the film to me, you know, that was the story. Um, I forgot your question, actually. Well, the similarities. I was thinking about... Uh, the, the time zone thing just clicked in, and I just time lost zone, it yeah. somewhere. <laughs> well, I was Where thinking, am I again? It seems, it seems as though that idea, that, that where the character of Oliver is oh, thinking yeah. through, things through by drawing, hmm. and, and, and those sorts of things. I'm just wondering. Yeah, yeah. So at the beginning, now I'm back on track, um, <laughs> I just knew I wanted to write about that. I didn't know how much of myself I was really going to put in. And um, as the film went along and as I was writing it, it became more and more clear how much no one wanted this film to happen. Really? <laughs> and, and, you know, my, when my dad passed away, it was like my second parent passing away. I was 38 years old. And I had like a pretty big crisis of just like, who am I? Can I make a film anymore? Uh, what can I do as a filmmaker that's unique and specific and all that? And also just this kind of like anger at how difficult it was to get the film made or just to get a meeting with anybody or to get anybody to pay attention. And the harder it got or the more unlikely it got that the film was going to happen, the more I stuffed myself into it or things that only I know how to do, like the drawings or just the graphic sensibility or my friend has a band named The Sads and somehow yeah. they got in or... Uh, my relationship with dogs or all this stuff just sort of started piling in. Um, so yeah, it's very contradictory my own perspective towards this film because on one level I do not like thinking about Ewan and Oliver as me. Yeah. And on the other level they are, you know, or to some degree they are. Yeah. But I feel like it's like it's as if, you know, you pack a little carry-on suitcase and you lived off of it for four years and that's, that's sort of what I did. I took a little bit of myself or pieces of myself gave it to Ewan, and he ran with it and made, like, a whole person out of it. And what about the relationship between Christopher and, and Ewan? That was a beautiful thing that happened between them that I actually got quite jealous about. <laughs> like, really? Because <laughs> they're, they're two actors that really admired each other. Ewan especially really... Christopher has so many hysterical stories about being an actor and working yeah. with, like, John Huston stories, Kazan stories. You know, he had just these crazy stories and, like being wildly drunk and doing Shakespeare on stage, you know, like yeah. stories that you can't compete with. And anyways, and there's like, you know, there's a family tribe thing of actors there. They do the same thing. And so they really like became this really tight unit. And I'd be like knocking on the door, like, remember me, you know? <laughs> and, um, but um, I think they really enjoyed each other. And I think Ewan especially, um, like we shot the, that. The, each side of the story chronologically so like from the beginning of the story to so in the, uh, this isn't spoiling it for anybody when the dad dies that comes at the end of Ewan and Christopher's time together and for you guys who've seen it when Ewan goes into that room and, and cries that is Ewan crying that's some very primal crazy place that he went to that has to do with his relationship to Christopher not just my script you know yeah whatever projection he got going in his head. Yeah. You told a great story last night, which I, I think people won't mind hearing again if they heard it, about um, how you um, kind of sent them off oh. to, to get to know each other, uh -huh. which I loved. And I think... Um, Does everybody want to hear the skinny jeans story again? <laughs> um, so with rehearsing, I don't really like actors that do the script over and over again. It's just it, you kind of just like dig a groove when you do that. And to me, it's really important that as you're shooting, you still don't know exactly what you're doing or what can happen next. And it's not like you're executing something that you previously thought out. And, you know, it needs to be alive. It needs to be slippery. It needs to be out of control to feel alive on, on film and to the audience. So I do all these weird experiential things to make the actors kind of feel what the characters supposedly have felt. And so... Um, we met, oh, I can add on to the story. Um, Christopher and Ewan, we met at the Beverly Hills Hotel. It's like a really fancy, posh, kind of famous hotel. And, and Beverly Hills is the only place Christopher Plummer stays. So that's where you have to meet him. <laughs> and uh, we had lunch. And, you know, Joan Collins, the actress, she comes up and looking like Joan Collins and with this huge hat on, it says, Christopher, are we going to be naked in the pool again? You know? And, <laughs> and me and Ewan are just like, woo! You know? And, uh, and then they, they have this little whispering chat, and then Christopher sits back down, and we're like, 
do tell, you know, and, and he was like, oh, no, no, no. And uh, <laughs> so it kind of set up this kind of neat dynamic where me and Ewan were like the kids and Christopher was like very paternal. So wow. the first thing I asked him to do was to go to Barney's. It's like a fancy department store. And I said, okay, Christopher, you're gay. You want to make yourself attractive to younger men. Ewan, you're going to help him. Christopher is at this time 79. Ewan's 38. And Ewan, you're going to, you know, just kind of take care of him. Not that Christopher needs a lot of taking care of, but, yeah. <laughs> you know, watch after him. And here's 300 bucks. I'm not, I should have given him more money, but that's all I had. And, um, and I said, get a scarf. That's easy. Maybe 300 bucks. Get a scarf. Make yourself look new yeah. and young. On the way there, they're in the, in the car, and Ewan's wearing skinny jeans, and Christopher looks at his pants and is like, those are awfully tight, you know? <laughs> and he's like, and then he actually did something to him, and they're kind of elastic, you know? And, and he was like, well, yeah, they're skinny jeans, and Chris, Christopher's like, skinny jeans. And I remember <laughs> Ewan said, he just said it many times, like, skinny jeans. Like, so he, they get to Barney's, and the scars are over to the left. Ewan heads that way. Christopher just takes off. Ewan can't control him. Ewan can't stop him. He's going to the jeans bar. He's flirting wildly with men and women um, to get his jeans. He's trying on everything. He's having Ewan look at his ass, you know, and how do I look? And that's actually a lot what it was like with me and my dad when my dad came out. My dad liked French Connection. Do you guys have that story here? Yeah, we had that. And we would go all the time, and my dad would be kind of like unconsciously flirting with a younger guy at the thing, and (laughs) and it was complicated. Um, And uh, so when they came back and told me the story, I was like, ah, this worked out. Um, And Christopher ended up buying... Ewan and I joke because every time we tell the story, the price goes up, but he bought somewhere between like $600 and $1,200 worth of jeans. And of course, being Chris or a plumber, he travels with no cash, you know? So, so Ewan had to pay for it. And, um, and then I didn't have enough money when he came back. And so all that entanglement, that unplanned, weird entanglement is the kind of thing I dream of as a director. You, you have a book out in 2009 called Graphics Films. And on the cover, it has a list. It says, one, number one, be more positive. Number two, try to stop anthropomorphizing the animals I know, or at least do it less. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'm just so interested in that idea of um, talking to the dog like it's a person, mm. or is it not a person? Mm. Can you talk to me about talking to dogs? Dead to dogs. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I... I've grown up with dogs, and um, we had, I had a, a marvelous standard poodle when I was a kid named Boo, who slept in bed with me and everything. It was my great companion, and like a, a, a maid come to school with me, all these sort of oh, yeah. Norman Rockwell kind of moments. Um, and uh, I have an older sister who sang to the dog very complicated songs, and I think that's where I started just always talking to them. And now I have a border collie, and border collies are tremendously um, audio stimulated. If I want to make my border collie wag her tail, I, I talk to her. You know, that's what gets her going. Um, it makes her happy. It makes her feel mm. connected. Um, and so, animals, dogs. Uh, ki- I live in Los Angeles. There's coyotes in my yard. There's mountain wow. lions nearby. Um, I feel like our relationship to animals is one of the best ways to understand what kind of humans we are. Um, uh, I am always just sort of gravitate towards animals. Um, I hope very much that I do not ever treat them as less than or as pets or Mm. as uh, my property, you know? Um, And instead of sort of, I remember talking to you and I was like, just pretend that Cosmo is like a highly intelligent alien visitor friend that doesn't speak our language or have our sort of mental paradigm or doesn't use the same sensory uh, orientation that we do. And I think that's actually pretty much what a dog is. Yeah. And Ewan really loved that idea and yeah. caught on to talk. Because it's so Cosmo, the dog in the movie, is awfully cute. And it's really easy to go like, ooh. Like, He's very like cute. Like cute talk when you talk to him. Or like, mm. ooh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it takes you a second to kind of just speak to him as a human, as a peer. But it's very important at the same time to, you know, talking dogs is a horrible anthropomorphization of dogs. They don't talk. Mm-hmm. That's what's beautiful about them. They don't use uh, language like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so in the film, I hope people get that it's Ewan or Oliver having both sides of the conversation. 
you know. But maybe he's get the, the answers that he's imagining are not what he naturally would have. I think yeah, the dog's the dog's face sort of does sort of prompt you to think different things. Yeah. Um, Cosmo was a very good good actor. Yeah, he well. is. Yeah. Or he's just a very, uh, you know, like. Uh, uh, you know, do you, are there any actors here? Does anybody works in the? Must be directors here. Like you know, when you hang out with actors, there's something about actors like their their uh, skin is thinner, their eyes are more transparent. You you they're just uh, a, a hotter soul to be around. You feel them more. And Cosmo is like that as a dog. Really? Like, he just, like, <laughs> if he was here, I've done a lot of Q&As and stuff with Cosmo, and everybody just goes, whoo, just to him, as they do to Ewan. It's actually really similar. Like, everybody, if Ewan was here, you would all just fall in love with him. It's some weird thing. You couldn't even control it. He, yeah. I'm, it, it's kind of sick, but it's true. Um, same thing with a dog. Everybody just falls in love with Cosmo, and then Cosmo just sort of expects it, and responds very kindly. He's like, yes, of course, and I love you too, you know. <laughs> and um, not all dogs have that. We had to get, to get um, bonded to get insurance in the normal American film oh, industry. Okay. You had to have a double, and his double's named JR. And JR just didn't have that. Really? That's so poor JR. Poor JR. <laughs> <laughs> and JR's a great Jack Russell, but he's, he just didn't have Cosmo's like uh, openness and uh, readability, emotional readability. Yeah. And so, was it you always directing Cosmo, or did you have oh, some no. help? The, he comes with. He's a very. He's a canine actor. He's a very trained guy. Um, he comes with this woman named Mathilde, um, who uh, is French and is wonderful and she's if you to those of you who've seen the movie she's in every single shot you don't see her she's hiding behind the bed oh, she's right. back with me she's somewhere around in that room um and but mostly she didn't have to do much with cosmo besides bond him to ewan and christopher yeah and there's a one little trick if anybody wants a dog training trick when you feed a dog when you're like a movie dog you never feed him just down here like usually you feed a dog like this. You put the food up to your eyes and then you feed him right away so that the dog isn't looking at your hands. He's looking at your eyes. Oh, so the eye and, contact. Because he's yeah. just such a straight man. He just yeah. does those shots to camera and he'll, and he'll walk into a room and pause. Yeah, and, you know, that he's, part It's is, like it's natural. It's amazing. That part was uncanny when there's these scenes where it's quite wide so the trainer can't really do much. And um, Ewan is showing him the room, and the dog walks in and listens to Ewan, and then looks around the room. And and uh, I was sitting <laughs> so with Matilda, we're you know watching the monitor because we had it was, like I said a wide shot, so we had to be pretty far back. And Matilda was like squeezing my arm so hard because her, her little dog was doing so well, you know. <laughs> she was like, and, uh, yeah. So good. Um, you guys, I'll ask one more question, and then we'll we'll throw it open so, so get we ready. can all get into the discussion. Yeah. But you guys can think about your question now. What should I ask? Yeah, let's ask a question. Yeah, so we'll we ask you a, a simple one. Oh, do you want to ask someone a question? Does anybody have a question? We can sort of intersperse. Look, a question. Oh, here we go. There's a microphone coming so everyone can hear. Hi. Uh, hi. Um, a, a double question. I'm not sure how if that's was... fair. <laughs> double. <laughs> uh, um, how was it you chose Christopher Plummer and Ewan McGregor for those roles, and were they your first choice? Uh-huh. Oh, tough one. Um, so you guys heard that. Um, they, you know, like I said, when I write, I don't really think of actors. Um, um, when I came to and had to start casting, I never thought that I could get people like that. So people sort of, you have a casting agent and, you know, your producers and people, and these lists of names start coming at you. And my biggest concern is that they actually feel like family and that they're like the right age and they kind of look, family there was some energetic connection so I remember when I put Ewan and Christopher next to each other and I was like holy crap they really do look quite similar and that was actually the first thing that Ewan said when he met Christopher it's like you look like my my dad and my uncle you know and um so in that way they they are my they were my first choice but that sounds so not like I think most people mean it like I thought of them you know and I planned it um and I had to get Oliver first because he's in the whole movie and I was like, okay, if I'm lucky enough to get Ewan, then Christopher would be amazing. But if it was someone else, if I had to go with someone else, well, as amazing as Christopher is, I might not have, it might not have fit, 
you know. So luckily I got Ewan, then I could do the Ewan Christopher thing, which was sort of my first choice in that way. And mm. Christopher, I mean, who doesn't want Christopher Plummer to play your 79-year-old art historian coming out of the closet father? You know, like he's so perfect to play like sort of an intellectual man. He's so worldly and cultured and he's so like that. And then my dad is born in 24, and who knows Christopher's actual age, but he's born in some early 30s, right? And um, there's something so specific about that generation, about those people. And when Christopher and I first met, he got Hal so deeply, almost more than I do in a funny way. And he was like, thank God he has wit. And I was like, wow, you sound like my dad, you know? And, and there is... There is something so key about that generation's use of humor and irreverence and a sort of subversive humor to get out of whatever corner they're in. So that's sort of why I picked him. And I looked at a lot of interviews on him, like on YouTube. I read his 650-page memoir called In Spite of Myself, which is actually quite funny. And, and I saw, like, oh, yeah, he's, he's really funny. He's really dry and he's really funny. And that was, that was a key thing to me. And then, of course, they're both such great actors are such great naturalistic actors mm -hmm. um, so that was more important to me than them being American because I have a very American movie with no Americans in it oh it's true hey that reminds me of something I've got here straight talking mm. you seem like a very honest person a very heterosexual talker yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> straight yeah. talking yeah, yeah true um, and I remember you oh on your blog, you've got a great post about sentimentality, which was a terrifying post as well. Um, and I think it was you talking about trying to avoid that in the script writing process. Mm -hmm. You also spoke about the actors as pretending but not lying, mm -hmm. um, which reminds me. But I, um, I, wonder, I, wonder, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how to tell a story like this that you're so enmeshed in and and still avoid it being sentimental at all? Well, hopefully I, I did that. You did, I Who think. knows? <laughs> um, but, um, I mean, that's your greatest... That was my greatest fear. It wasn't, like, revealing myself or revealing my dad or revealing all these things I don't even know totally or don't understand or don't control. Then my fear was, like, oh, my God, what if I end up telling just the most narcissistic, self-pitying, <laughs> unconsciously self-pitying... Uh, uh, sentimental poor, oh poor me my dad you know <laughs> thing yeah. that, oh my god how embarrassing and horrendous would that be and I'm yeah. sure there's some people who think I did that but um, so that was my I had that was in the front of my brain all the time and my fear of that was so great that it was easy to be quite unprecious about me and my dad or quite um, mindful of the eventual audience Mm. All those strangers in the dark room that eventually are your real goal and what you really should always keep in mind and, and, and embrace, you know? Yeah. So that actually, it actually helped a lot because it was like, okay, this is just my version of my dad and part of me, and it's one version of many, and um, it's mm. not even uh, a documentary, not that I even believe in, like, objective truth and documentary. Yeah. And it kind of loosened everything up. It's a story. And Christopher is my dad. That isn't the house he lives in. Uh, you know, I don't get out of cars that handsomely. Um, uh, and and, it, and it, um, it, I committed myself to that. And it, I don't know. It, it wasn't that hard. It was kind of freeing. Yeah. The quote that you have on your blog is terrifying. The James Baldwin quote, which I love. You guys, you have to hear this. It's quite... It's, it's quite terrifying. It's from, it's from, is that right, everybody's protest novel? Uh, yeah. Yeah, which is a book from 1955. It says, Sentimentality, the ostentatious parading of excessive and spurious emotion, is the mark of dishonesty, the inability to feel. The wet eyes of the sentimentalist betray his aversion to experience, his fear of life, his arid heart, and it is always, therefore, the signal of secret and violent inhumanity, the mask of cruelty... <laughs> So that's like the don't inside mess with of your James head. Baldwin. Yeah. <laughs> but that's an amazing quote. I Isn't think. it terrifying? Or it's so honest and so accurate. Yeah. I think. But you got, I think um, what I really liked was you talking about um, you talked about two different dudes. Lou Reed as a dude who kind of avoided that. 
Uh-huh. And Bob Dylan as well. You listen to him uh, uh-huh. while writing it, I think. All right. Um, when I was on this same note, um, when I started writing the script, I, uh, I was just one day listening to Dylan, and I heard, you know, Rainy Day Women, the... Everybody must get stoned. I kind of torture you with my version of it. Uh, and that song, it's so loose and wild and unsentimental and kind of raw. And then just that line, every, there's no need to feel all alone. Everybody must get stoned. It's a very good anti-self-pity mantra, you know. And just the blues and what the blues really meant, as in like New Orleans jazz from the teens and 20s. It meant that our sadness, our disappointment, our confusion isn't private. It's something that we share as humans, and that in the sharing of it, there's some sort of relief, you yeah. know? And there's no need to take it so personally, you know? Yeah. And so in that way, people ask me all the time, is this therapeutic, is this cathartic, you know, doing the yeah. film? Um, not really. Uh, going to a therapist is therapeutic, you yeah. know? And I do that. Um, but... Uh, it was therapeutic in that it really radically depersonalized me from myself, yeah. you know, and me and my dad from my, uh, uh, you know, me being my dad's son. I was sort of like the author of my father all of a sudden, the author of the story, yeah. which required a lot of distancing or not taking it personal. So I played that Dylan song a lot to just to kind of keep reminding me of, one, this, like, I'm, I'm going to... Uh, use that looseness and that wildness, which yeah. I always associate with. Uh, I always associate sentimentality with like a coddling softness yeah. and that kind of brazen looseness. I, I think is the opposite. Um, and then Lou Reed, I, I wrote about in the blog too. Just in that, I think that Lou Reed, as much as he wrote about difficult things, things, emotions, and things that are sort of caustic or you don't want to hear or um, don't fit into like a sweet mode. He delivered the songs, both in his physical performance and the actual songwriting, in quite a hooky way, with the audience always in mind, with the need to communicate his story to an audience. And like, like I also love Pavement. Like, are there any Pavement fans here? Like, Pavement is very much like not thinking about the audience in a way as much yeah. as I love payment or they're not reaching out in the same way that Lou Reed was co- almost like a vaudevillian to me like he's a he's a performer that knows he's a performer and I tried to always remember that with this film because I'm actually more pavement <laughs> yeah right <laughs> and I was trying to remind myself reach out to the audience remember the audience if you have something to say that's like not the normal story 75 year old man coming out and being horny you know um, uh, remember to use the tools of filmmaking to bring the audience close and keep them with you. Yeah. And have you found, um, have you sort of felt as you've been going around the world talking about the film to everybody um, that people have responded? That, that, that you, what you were trying to do uh. or communicate? Has, has worked? Or have you found that people are seeing other things in the film and, and you're really surprised? And Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I have been like to like three or four European countries and 12 United States cities, which are really should... The United States should be like five countries, right? It's so weirdly different in different regions. And... Um, and every night you tend to do Q&As. You tend to... And often in the, in the States, as part of my tour... The, the screenings are just like free tickets to a movie with Christopher Plummer in suburban Atlanta, you know? <laughs> so it's not like film people are coming. The screening wasn't organized by the local LGBT community, you know? It's yeah. like whoever comes. And then I do a Q&A at the end. Sometimes it's a little spooky. Um, <laughs> and the weird thing is people uh, interpret films so crazily subjectively. People um, have such strange things that you never intended, and that's just yeah. normal. That All my filmmaker friends, I'm sure there's a lot of filmmakers here that have that. It's like, whoa, you thought that? You know? And that's just part of the thing. It doesn't mean he did anything wrong. That's how films go over. In the same breath, it's really weird. So I did write this very specific, personal, concrete, kind of small in scope yeah. story it's really weird to go to Berlin and have all these people kind of react to my dad in a similar yeah. way as I did in Phoenix and London yeah. and um, it does it, 
does, it's a very positive experience. It really is, makes you believe in communication. Yeah. <laughs> it makes you believe you can connect to people. It's um, been very sweet in lots of ways. Yeah. Does anyone else have another? Um, I was, I'm just wondering, um, the film has kind of two stories going through it that are running and going back and forth. Um, my question is more to do with Melanie Laurent's character. Mm-hmm and her relationship with Oliver. And I'm just wondering if she's based on anyone or mm-hmm. any personal experiences that you've had. I mm-hmm. love their relationship. I love how they got to know each other. Um, yeah, and I'm just wondering if, if, if mm-hmm. she's a woman that you know or you've taken yeah. different parts of people or if it's completely fictional. Well, the truth is she's sort of, you know, the truth is I'm a beautiful blonde French woman underneath and it's, <laughs> you know, it's just me. Um, that that couple that I definitely everything that happens with those people I know about or I've experienced or I have some access to it's the only way I can write. So I wasn't trying to do that part of the story isn't as much of a direct portrait as the other side of the story, um, and it's very much things that I've happened happened to me I know about I've gone through in terms of like having diff- great difficulties kind of believing in love or believing that it's going to stay or believing that it's going to happen. Um, um, but I do feel like I was talking about so many of my friends and so many people I know, men and women, gay and straight, people kind of my generation and younger. And I felt like I was talking about these kind of chronic things, you know. Um, so it's things that I know about. Um, it's, uh, you know, just some gender swapping, you know, and it works pretty easily. Um, and... Uh, it's a lot of my friends who share, and I could, the story of her having this kind of too close of a relationship to a parent, being sort of an emotional peer, uh, which is both this great reward and sometimes this great burden. Man, I can think of like 10 of my friends that have that, you know? Yeah. And I think it's very something of our, these, all of us who were born sort of like Vietnam and up, you know? And that's American history, but you know. Um, uh, so, yeah. And was she always going to be French? No. Or did she just turn out to be French? Yeah. I, I just wrote her, like, I wanted to write someone who's, like, very extroverted in contrast to all of her sort of more introvertedness. And I, and I was hanging out a lot with, um, I did this film called Thumbsucker. And um, I, was, I was writing Beginners, the beginning of Beginners, way back in the beginning of Beginners, <laughs> um, as I was doing the press tour for Thumbsucker. And I was hanging out with Lou Pucci, the kid from... Uh, from the from film. Tom Sucker. And, um, and I was just thinking about actors a lot. And I was just around actors all the time. And I, kinda, I really admire actors. I love actors. I'm formerly a very shy person. I'm always kind of like wanting to be more like an actor. When you did know? you stop being shy? Um, it's funny to say you're formally... A, I mean, I usually... I, I, did you just wake up one day and... No, it's a gradual <laughs> process. I'm 45 now. That's one great thing about age is you get more and more like, fuck it. You know, it's exhausting being shy. It's just, it's, it is exhausting. And it just wears off. Like, I just, yeah. I'm going to leave that five pound weight behind. Um, do, you think it, do you think that being a shy person makes a difference in the way you make a film compared to the way someone else might? Oh, uh, sure. I mean, I'm, I'm the kind of director, the, I'm like the enabler director. I'm not the right. yeller director. Like, I like everybody to have a good time. I want the actors and the crew to feel like, like, that was great. And I think yeah. that's like a shy person's goal. That's not like a... <laughs> All the time, That's right. not like a dominatrix's goal, you know? Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I'm about creating a very playful set, making everybody feel empowered, making people feel happy. Not, not that I can't be an ass, but, like, that's how I feel comfortable. Yeah. And I think I'd approach it more like a documentary. I'm trying to, like, create a world and capture things rather than... than uh, manufacture everything and make sure everything hits these points and it must be so. I'm very kind of the opposite of it must be so. Yeah. I you think said that comes from being more um, watching the world than being like a dominating actor in it. Yeah. You said about your camera technique or you described it as the alien that landed and doesn't know what's important. Uh huh. Which is kind but, of, is that a description of you as well sort of? Yeah. That's funny. Never thought of that. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Um, that was something I used to do. That doesn't really show up so much in Beginners, but I used to love that idea of, like... Well, Beginners has it a little bit. This, like, inability to, to hierarchicalize, like, what is important? If you think of, 
of of camera position in that way like the face is usually what we all focus on but if you're an alien you don't know that it actually creates a very interesting problem you know of what to look at and yeah. what is important and the parts of the history those little like history essays in the film it's like you know this is what a this is what pets look like this is what the president look like this is what the stars look like this is what inventions look like there's there's no hierarchy typical hierarchicalization everything's kind of leveled out yeah. in a way that's actually kind of funny or maybe revealing or yeah this, this guy oh, here he's got is, his he's microphone got, he's ready. He's yeah he's ready question ready and microphone yeah. um, I just wanted to find out about the structure of the film um, it's quite it's obviously non-linear uh, was that a decision from the start or was that from uh, through the editing process uh, I wrote it yes. that way and um, part of it's just because I started writing it like six months after my dad passed and like when you're in that time the it's really hard to stay in the present you're always like remembering things or the littlest thing will like really throw you into this deep memory and so in that way is very much just where I was um also I just love films that aren't one two three four you know I feel actually freer and more honest and more like it's easier if I'm not doing that but the film isn't just totally a chronological it has like four chronologies that interweave there's the Oliver and Anna love story which goes from one to ten you know it doesn't go back and forth there's the dad that goes from one to ten there's the mom which mostly goes from one to ten and then there's these history things which do certain years so it's so to me I, that's different than if it was just all over the place how many times did you write it um, I mean, I started writing it in March 2005, and I shot it in the fall of 2009, and I was writing the whole time. Yeah. You know, it's a very long, uh, you know, deep going upriver, not knowing if you're doing it right or wrong. The most difficult thing it, that I've ever done is writing, for sure. Yeah. We've got another. Uh, just wondering what filmmakers or films you're inspired by. Mm. So many. I mean, I really love, uh, um, you know, I, I am a very good uh, museum director's son. Like, I love art and literature and design. And, you know, I was so happy at the National Gallery looking at the Vienna show. Um, in terms of filmmaking, in this film in particular, there's a really gorgeous Hungarian film by Isvan Zazbo called Love Film from 1970. Like Very few people know about it. It's a gorgeous film about memory and history and love that really influenced this. Um, um, a lot of, in writing this, I was kind of bummed out and who am I and what do I know how to do? And I kind of went back to all those first films I saw in art school that really got me excited about filmmaking. And I was like, who care if, if Fellini's kind of like a director cliche to love eight and a half? I fucking love eight and a half. I'm going to, you know. And this film was very eight and a half to me, both with a, a you know, with a, the sort of multiple layered storyline, uh, you know, Oliver as a graphic designer, sort of you're seeing his work, Fellini in eight and a half as a director or, you know. Marcello Mostrani is a director. Um, and it's a person, it's a very personal movie, Eight and a Half. It's really Fellini's trying to work out his crap with women, you know, right? And he made it into a story. Same thing actually with Love Film. It's very personal, but he made it into a story. So I, I looked at that a lot. I love early Truffaut, like shoot the piano player tonally, the way it goes from drama to silly to, to, to naturalistic. I... Woody Allen, those films I just talked about. Godard, the way that he blew open w filmmaking language, and the way that my film includes like graphics and drawing and history and narration and not. I feel like that's a, I'm walking in Godard's shadow when you make a film like that. The, um, do you know Jorgen Loth? He's a Danish filmmaker. Do you, has anybody seen like The Five Obstructions? The, the um, what's his name? The, um, Lars von Trier film he oh. did with the, and this is an older Danish filmmaker he asked to do all these obstructions anyways go get that DVD and on it there's a film by Jorgen Loth called The Perfect Human which is or look at my blog it's on there and um, that's an amazing film you talked about oh I don't know if you did it for I just imagined it but being beware, uh, beware of 
influences, almost like worrying that um, things will influence you too much and well, trying to go to other art forms yeah, instead I, of like film. Yeah. When you're yeah. doing film, it's not good to think about, in this film, it's really not good to think about Annie Hall too much. Yeah. This film has some similarities with it, just the territory love, new love, kind of in, innovative filmmaking, hopefully. Um, so you kind of try to, I don't, like when I'm making a film, I don't look at any films except for like Charlie Chaplin and Wallace and Gromit. That's all I can watch for like a year. And because um, you don't want to, you don't want to unconsciously be influenced. But like, you know, Dylan or uh, anything else can be like wildly helpful. And I love the company of other artists I love. Like that, um, whatever depression I have, that's one of the best solvers of it. It's like, I was like, uh, look at the, like, at the show here. Like, those Egon Sheila watercolors. Oh, my God, those are gorgeous, you know. And I get some weird camaraderie. <laughs> Not that yeah. I'm nearly as good as Egon and Sheila, but I get some, like, uh, connection, camaraderie, feeling not alone, feeling like I want to be like that. I hope I could do something half as good as that. And that's very exciting, heartening, um, helpful to me. Yeah. Um, first of all, I want to say I really loved your film. Oh, great. It was really enjoyable. We had a great time watching it. And I also really loved your wife's film, The Future. Oh. And um, I worked for two producers for a long time who were making films at the same time, different films, and I was wondering how much influence you and your wife have on each other's films. How much influence my wife and was? how involved you are in each other's films. And... My wife? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so my wife is Miranda July, who's a really awesome filmmaker and human. And um, we met at Sundance when our films were in competition with each other, which is hysterical oh way to meet. Um, and then we went to many film festivals together. And of course, she won all the prizes, and I didn't. And it was great. Um, <laughs> and uh, Miranda's been a huge influence on me because I think she's so good and she's such a great writer and just watching her and just understanding how hard it is like really helped me. It's not personal how hard it is to write. I'm not some failure. It's just hard, you know? Um, the love story, it isn't me and Miranda, but being in love with Miranda really brought me up close to like how love brings out all the craziest parts in you or in all the parts that you don't really want to deal with and, and it's only love can really bring those out in a weird way. And that's what I think a lot of Oliver and Anna are about. Um, um, but, you know, we don't, like, sit around and talk about work a lot. We don't read each other's scripts very much. We don't look at each other's films very much because the last thing we want to do is, like, be filmmakers. We want to be cuddling, you know, and walking <laughs> and getting out of that freaking world and having another life. And especially because, you know, we're kind of... I was 38 when I met her and she was 30 and... You know, it'd be different if we were like 22 when we met. We kind of got our work thing set up and mm -hmm. looking for a, a life outside of work. Um, but she's a huge, I mean, the biggest, the most honest answer is I better fucking do good. I'm married to Miranda July. Holy shit. <laughs> you know? And that's like a high bar that's like with me every day. Is that why she didn't come to Melbourne for her film? Oh, her film like... is premiering tonight in Los in New York. So oh, she's wow. in New York. It it or, or what? What is today? Today's Saturday. Yes, yeah, so it's Saturday. Friday night there just recently. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so she's there. Fair enough. Yeah, but we don't like. We do some things together, and our films weirdly came out this year. So we were at some festivals together again, and that's neat. Like when I show up at the hotel and her her suitcase is there, that's really great. But like I said, the, the funnest part of our life is when we're not doing this, our life together, you know. I just want to ask, uh, how did you get uh, to direct your first major film, The Thumbsucker? I yeah. love it, by the way, and uh -huh. it was really good. And have you uh, come across any problems in the production phase that made it difficult to, to work the way you wanted? Oh, yeah. I mean... And, and, uh, uh, what would you be advice to all those young film makers out there and uh, looking to enter the industry? Yeah. Thanks. So what's my advice to young filmmakers entering the industry? Is that what you said? Don't. Um, <laughs> I, I kind of mean that. You had to like be your own industry. You should never wait for the industry to say you're ready, here's your money, or you're, now you're a professional, or now you're good enough, because it'll never work out. 
and you have to just make as much as you can on your own and be as independent as you can and then they will come to you and hopefully more on your terms um, and yeah just keep generating stuff and so you, as a director you always get stuck in this thing of like I gotta get money to make the thing I gotta wait to get the actor to get the money to make the thing just find some way to make things as consistently as you can and that way you'll develop your own language and you'll that's what all the great people do they have a thing that people get on their ship not vice versa and the other thing I always say that um, you know Ang Lee the amazing director I got to um, have a I begged for an interview with him because I love the Ice Storms one of my favorite movies and I got to have that, that like meeting where I was like how'd you do this how'd you do that how should I do this is before Thumbsucker and he's really nice and he's really generous and at the end of the meeting he gets up and he says oh the most 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 important thing the thing that I really should tell you and I was like yes and I was, I was imagining it was going to be like always light from the left or like some <laughs> trick and he goes everything I said could be totally wrong you know and that was the I still I tell the story all the time because I think it was like the most magical generous empowering thing that a master ever told a student and that not that I'm a master um, <laughs> but um, in, in that it was like my answers aren't your answers you know like my way in the industry my way of lighting my way of dealing with actors isn't yours and you know you got to figure out your own thing and I, 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 I practically cried when he said that I think um, and then were there problems in making Thumbsucker? Filmmaking is this, if you like problems, you'll love filmmaking because it's just like problem city. That's all it is. It's just things not going as you intended, uh, raining when it's not. You know, when I'm making a film, I constantly have dream nightmares. Of like, I'm supposed to be shooting a big scene outside, but I'm in a subway in New York, and I got the actors, and we got to go now. And it's like, okay, how am I going to make this look outside, you know? Or it's, you know, I'm in a muddy horse crowd, but it's a love scene. Okay, um, you know, stay off the mud. Um, and, and that's actually the real, the reality of filmmaking is not very dissimilar from that nightmare, you know. And you got to just find ways to, like, roll with it, I, I find. Hi, Mike. Hi. Um, Thumbsucker is one of my very favorite films. Wow. And what re resonated with me most was the evolution of Keanu Reeves' character in that. Was that based on anyone? And secondly, is Keanu a really great guy? I'm yeah. You'll say yes. <laughs> awesome question. Keanu, I mean, I haven't seen Keanu for years, but he was so, he was a really good guy. He only worked for like three or four days in that film, but then he did a lot of press afterwards. And, um, oh my God, it's, it happens a little bit with Ewan, but you do press at Keanu and people just freaking attack him, you know? Like, we're at, we're at Toronto or some festival and it's like one of those those huge press conferences with like 200 journalists and you're on a table and people would say like are you still in your band and he'd say no it's like good it sucked and it's like hello you know is that even professional and he's like a target for that it's really weird so he's very sweet very humble very down to earth he shows up alone on his motorcycle we weren't doing thumb sucker by the time we were in a suburb of portland and we would have to put the trailers in a circle, like Cowboys and Indian style, because there'd be like two, three hundred people would come, because it was when the Matrix was happening, and he was, and he would finish his work and then just head into that crowd, and we'd be like, ah, you know, do you you don't have to, we have security, you don't have to, you can just go home. He's like, they want the one, they, and he would go <laughs> and just sign things forever. Or I have a great friend who is a PA. On the on Thumbsucker, and he um, he doesn't have much money, and, he, and he, there was this girl he had a crush on that was going to New York, and he's like, I don't have enough money to go, and it was on Keanu's last day, and so Keanu left. A day later, I don't even know how he got this, but some messenger came up and gave Fernando a first class plane ticket to New York. You know, oh, that's so, so that's great. very Keanu. He's very he's very sweet. He's kind of um, creepy in Thumbsucker, though. Isn't he? I don't think so. I think he's great. Um, <laughs> it's not creepy. Um, uh, the, that script was based on a book by Walter Kern, so that's it's. He came out of that book, and uh, he's not. He's that's a his character. Is something that you know, Keanu and Walter and I sort of concocted. You know? I was going to ask you about your technique for producing a movie itself, mm. and you were saying earlier how it's quite organic. You know, you're trying to let things happen. Um, 
that's almost the opposite of the previous style of the old one camera, blah, 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 dialogue, stop the camera, turn it around, blah, 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 dialogue. Are you also using multiple cameras? Are you also using, taking advantage of the new technology with DSLRs? Because the truth today is you can do things, obviously, in a different way than you would with film, say, yeah. five, yeah. six years ago. Are you embracing that, or are you still traditionally 100% uh, film? Um, no, no, I... Um um, I shot this on the red, you know, and and um, I have some beef <laughs> again. I have some issues with the red, but uh, but I actually there's a lot of it that I like. And one of the key things being that you turn that camera on, you got 20 minutes of one and one drive on one take, and it was amazing because I could go you know roll, and then the, the actors would do a take, and I would say you say still rolling, so everybody was like like still on and then I could slowly walk in and go hey what a, what a thing about this or what if this happened whatever still you know the camera's just going and then I'd slowly walk out and I did that on purpose to kind of create this like casual vibe to kind of create this like um, you know the crew can't enter the scene because your camera's on and you're shooting still but you don't have that tension of like oh my god the, cam the film's going through the gate you gotta quickly do it and that heightenedness or that that um, mm, that urgency. I tried to take that out, and that was great. And we did a lot of tests with um, whatever it's called, the D5, you know, when we were shooting. And and you know, my heroes are Godard and Truffaut, and if they were 25 today, they'd be using that. And and I'm much more interested in the story and the energy in front of the camera than what kind of camera is recording it, you know. Um, and using two cameras, that's a privilege. That's twice as expensive. So I do it once in a while, but you can't afford to do it all the time. And it creates like a weird kind of sloppy vibe on the set a little bit. Or if you have two cameras, you're a little bit hosing it down. You know, you're kind of... Um, it's almost... One camera has a precision and a carefulness that I kind of appreciate. But two cameras is great because, hey, you can overlap dialogue. You can just... You can you can potentially get your scene totally done in like one take. What Thanks, was, Mike. Oh, that was it. Is there <laughs> so anticlimactic? Is there Are we all going to cry or anything? Um, <laughs> We're not going to cry. Um, I have some books of the drawings. I have four. Um, oh, you have volunteers. How the hell are we going to do this? Um, okay, so our nice friend in the back, she waved. He waved. And stripes, because I love stripes, and other stripes. It's male and female stripes. Okay. Uh, wish we could show what it looks but like. But thank you guys so much. It was really sweet meeting thank you, you all. Yeah. Uh.